Welcome to Genomics Unlocked, the number one platform for all things genomics. Today's episode focuses on clinical exome sequencing to reporting, featuring Dr. Charles E. Chappell, Dr. Manuel Del Perro, and finally, Dr. Marcella Galvez. Welcome everyone, um, and good day. My name is Brett Berderman, and it is a pleasure to be hosting you all today for our inaugural webinar in the Genomics Unlocked series. So just as a, some background into Genomics Unlocked, so this is a, a series to offer a, a platform for knowledge uh, sharing where uh, speakers can showcase their experience while providing attendees with uh, easy access to a diverse range of genomics topics and applications such as clinical exomes, uh, agriculture, some hot topics like Stereoseq, for example, uh, that are driven on DNBC technology. Um, and by providing or bringing together expert scientists, researchers, and industrial uh, partners to talk about their experience. So first things first, uh, some of you may not be familiar with GoToWebinar. So uh, this uh, platform you will see should be on your right hand side uh, is the, the GoToWebinar tool. So there is a, a question function there. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, uh, you can ask in there and we can respond or just wait at the end of the webinar where we would have a question and answer sec uh, session. So today, um, we are, are excited to invite speakers from GenCell, uh, Sathator, and MGI to talk about clinical exomes sequencing to reporting. Within the Genomics Unlocked webinar series, we do have quite a few other webinars that are, are upcoming, and you should see a few webinars coming out throughout the year. So we do have some coming up this month. So the next one is whole exome sequencing with DMB-Seq uh, from a, a clinical service provider perspective. And then also a genomic um, agriculture genomics with uh, genomic selection. So that'll be quite exciting. So now with, uh, without further ado, so thank you all for joining the first webinar uh, series within the, the Genomics Unlocked, uh, or within Genomics Unlocked uh, called Clinical Exomes Sequencing to Reporting. So I would now like to introduce you to Dr. Manuel Del Perro from MGI, who completed his PhD in bioinformatics from the University of Berlin, focused within the fields of genomics and is utilizing his experience within uh, bioinformatics to support Europe and African region at MGI as a bioinformatics support uh, scientist. So welcome uh, Manuel and yeah, I'm looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Brett. And with this first presentation, I would like to introduce the workflow from sequencing to analysis that we have developed specifically in MGI and focusing on wall exome sequencing and the MB67 specifically. So for wall exome sequencing, actually, we mean the sequencing of the exome, so the protein coding regions of an individual genome. And this means that it's around 1% to 2% of the uh, whole human genome and is containing a high content of disease-associated variants. Now, the advantage of performing wall exome sequencing, for example, compared to wall genome sequencing, is that it's cost-effective and it allows a better interpretation of disease-causing variations specifically. In MGI, we have different uh, sequencing platforms platforms, as uh, you might know already, that allow a different uh, data output, in particular when we talk about wall exome sequencing data. For example, starting from the uh, loss throughput sequencer, we have our um, new platform, the G99, which uh, if we consider, for example, a P150 mod with 150x coverage, we can use to sequence up to one sample per flow cell and therefore by running two different and independent uh, flow cells in parallel we can sequence up to two wall exome sequencing samples. The second uh, platform is the DMBSEC G400. In this case with the same uh, specification we can sequence up to 50 samples per flow cell and also in this case having two independent flow cells running in parallel we can sequence up to uh, 100 samples. And in the end, we have our DMB67, which is the high throughput uh, sequencer that we have available. And with the same settings, also in this case, we can sequence a very high number of samples, in particular 96 uh, samples per flow cell. And then in four independent flow cells running in parallel, we can sequence uh, up to 380 uh, wall exome sequencing samples. Now, to understand the data process of how we uh, process the data to generate the FASTQ files and the report, we can 
say that the, the process is quite similar across the platforms. So we start with the collection of the raw images, we record the images for each cycle, and then we perform an intensity extraction. And from the intensity values, we perform a correction based on the background noise. And after that, we perform a base call and fret score assignment. So at the end of the uh, data acquisition process, we will end up with our first few files and the reports, which specifically are summary report with the metrics and the quality information of the sequencing run. So most important, at the end of the sequencing run, we generate the first few files. And to understand better how the first few files look like in MGI, they are a standard FASTQ file, so they follow the standard FASTQ structure, which means that they are TXT file. And if we open the FASTQ files, we can have the information, we can see the information of the reads that were actually sequenced during the run. In particular, the information for, for each read is divided in four different lines of the TXT file. The first line is uh, defined as the header. The second line is the actual read sequence. Then we have the plus character. And in the end, we have the, um, the quality information for the read sequence. So uh, what differs from third-party FASTQ files, in particular in this case, is the header, which is specific of the MGI instruments, of course, and the header is structured uh, in this way. So we start with the read identifier, which is a fixed character. Then we follow by the flow cell ID in green here. And then we have the lane number information, so in which uh, lane the read was actually sequenced. We have the FOV information, which is the field of view, and then we have the read number followed by, in the end, um, by a specific number, which can be either one or two, based if we are looking at the forward or at the reverse reads. So it will be one for the forward reads, while it will be a two for the reverse read. And it's, um, uh, it's very important to understand, actually, how we can process these FASTQ files for the, uh, for the uh, further analysis. As we, we are looking at standard FASTQ file, we can, of course, have different types of scenario for the analysis uh, based on the workflow that we want to define. So when we talk about what exome sequencing uh, analysis in particular, I would like to define three different steps. The first step is the primary analysis, which means to write FASTQ files from the raw, uh, raw sequencing data. Now, the primary analysis can be done, for example, if we consider uh, the DMV-SEC G400, can be performed directly on the sequencer, and the sequencer will output directly the, the, the multiplex FASTQ files. While if we consider the nmb 67 in this case, we have three different possibilities to process uh, and to generate FASTQ files. One possibility is to use the base code server, so the standalone T7. Another possibility is to use um, hardware devices that we have developed in MGI. The first one is Zitron Light, which is specifically designed to perform the write fastq function and therefore to write fastq files from the high amount of data generated from the T7. And the second hardware solution is Zitron Pro, which is a more complete solution designed for primary and also for secondary analysis. Now, for secondary analysis, when we talk about Wolexome sequencing data, we mean from fastq to VCF files. And in this case, uh, we can perform the secondary analysis by using Zitron Pro that we already mentioned, or by using open source tools, so best, pra best practices tools that can be uh, used to design a specific pipelines, which can be, for example, Minimap2, BWA, and GATK, and so on. That can be used, of course, with our FASTQ files. And uh, another method, of course, is to use third-party softwares that uh, will perform the secondary analysis. And uh, the, the last part of the analysis when we talk about Wolexome sequencing data in particular is to perform uh, the annotation and the uh, clinical report of the data. And in this case, uh, it can be done by using third-party software solution that can provide, of course, the generation of the clinical report. Now, in MGI, we have developed two specific solutions which are designed for primary and secondary analysis, so to write FASTQ files and to perform FASTQ to VCF. The first one, as we saw already, uh, called Zitron Light. In this case, the solution is bundled with uh, the, the mb 7 sequencer to facilitate the write FASTQ process, because of course, if we want to run four different independent flow cell in parallel, it takes, um, a, it's, it's a very computationally heavy task, and therefore the Zitron Light uh, server, which is independent from T7, can uh, help the, the sequencing process and the turnaround time. 
for example, if we want to sequence four independent uh, flow cells in parallel by using the T7 standalone, it would take around three hours per flow cell, while if we use the combination of T7 with Zitron light, the speed time will be down to 0.6 hours per flow cell. The secondary analysis solution that we have in MGI is called Zitron Pro, a more complete solution because in addition to perform the primary analysis, can also perform secondary analysis, and it also includes storage solutions, so up to 1,000 terabytes of storage, and it includes a specific hardware combination, uh, which is called heterogeneous computing specifically, which includes uh, different types of hardware structures, so the FPGA, GPU, and the CPU to accelerate the secondary analysis. In addition, it comes with specific applications like the laboratory management system pro, and uh, the specific pipelines for whole genome and whole exome sequencing analysis. Better at the functionality and the hardware and software solution deployed in Zitron Pro, we have specifically a redundant system. So starting from up to bottom, we have uh, two switches, two computing nodes, two HPCs, and storage arrays based on the solution that we want to, we want to have. In addition to the hardware, we also have the software, so the first software is called Megabolt, which is specifically the pipeline that is running on the hardware designed for whole exome and whole genome sequencing analysis. And the second software is the laboratory management system called Zilliums Pro. Now the Megabolt pipeline that is running on the Zitron solution, it's very fast thanks to the uh, heterogeneous computing system. In particular, if we consider the germline whole exome sequencing pipeline with a 400x coverage sample, to analyze this sample, it would take uh, around six minutes by using the heterogeneous computing system of Zitron Pro, while if we run the same uh, pipeline on a basic CPU hardware, it would take up to 12 hours. And therefore, this secondary analysis solution, it's very good for uh, a reduced uh, uh, time in the analysis. Now, the Megaball pipeline specifically is using open source tools that are accelerated thanks to the specific hardware that is deployed on uh, on Zitron Pro, and the open source tool, as we said before, as our best practices tool that are usually used to, uh, to build a secondary analysis pipeline. So specifically, we start with performing quality control on the ROFAS-Q files, uh, mapping against the reference genome by use Minimap2 or either BWA, BWMM. Then we perform a duplicate marking base quality score recalibration using always GTK. And then from the CleanBound files, we perform a variant calling, specifically can be germline or somatic variant calling by using tools deployed always in GATK. And in addition, we can perform CMV and SV calling by using CMV to the back dancer. So this is a complete workflow that can uh, use, of course, open source tool to be accelerated on the heterogeneous system of uh, Zitron Pro. And as we said before, the FASTQ files follow a standard uh, FASTQ structure, and therefore that's why we can use open source tool and, and uh, uh, build, of course, a more customized uh, secondary analysis solution. Now, to summarize the whole workflow, one of the possible solutions that we can have uh, from sequencing to analysis by including also MGI solution, we have our DMB67 that is generating the uh, raw sequencing files. In this case, they are called uh, call files. The call files are transferred to Zitron Light for the primary analysis, which is generating the FASTQ files, and then the FASTQ files are transferred to Zitron Pro for the secondary analysis, and Zitron Pro will generate the VCF files that can be used afterwards by third-party software for the uh, clinical report generation. Now, of course, this workflow can be highly customizable depending on the, on the necessities, and of the type of analysis we want to perform. In particular, for the secondary analysis, we can use uh, third-party uh, software or either open source tools implemented in uh, specific pipelines. So it's highly customizable and depends on the, on the customer tend to, to define which kind of workflow they want to have. All from my side, thanks for your uh, time and attention. And if you have any other questions, then we can talk better at the end of the presentation. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you, Manuel, uh, for the presentation on bioinformatics tools to support uh, the clinical workflows. So now I would like to invite Charles Chappell from Safatol, who is going to guide you through Avastome Clinical and the ease of analysis for applications such as whole exome 
So Charles is the Chief Scientific Officer of Safetor with an immense background in genomics and bioanalytics in NGS data for variant calling and annotation. So I would uh, now pass it on to Charles. And yes, welcome, Charles. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation. So yes, my name is Charles Chappell. I will be showing you how the virus and clinical platform works and some of the features you can use to, to analyze your data. So starting from the beginning, so what, what you're seeing is a live demo. I hope there'll be no, no glitches, but I apologize in the case that there are. So what you see here is the main interface of the virus and clinical platform. Each of these gray boxes represents a sample and an analysis that has been run on the sample. So uh, taking from the beginning, your first step would be to go to upload your files so we can support uh, either FASTQ files, in which case we would perform the variant calling ourselves, or you can give us a VCF file with uh, already detected variants. In either case, you would just go here and up select the files you want to upload. Those would be validated and then they would be available for analysis. So we offer several types of analysis. We can do, as I said, germline. Uh, either FASTQ or uh, VCF in both germline and somatic. We also offer a tumor normal analysis. So this is a paired uh, tumor and healthy sample from the same patient and CNV analysis. So I'll just show you some of the main uh, options here. If you go to the germline analysis, in this case, you can choose the file that you want to analyze. You can add a description, which is very much for your own uh, uh, use later. You can also associate a VCF file. So in this case, I'm using a FASTQ file. And if you already have a VCF with a CNVs associated with your sample, you can uh, run these together. And you can also uh, associate the sample to specific uh, phenotypes, for example, megalocornea or anything else. We use both uh, OMIM and HPO terms uh, here. And you can choose either one. And then you can choose the reference genome, 1819 or 1838, whether you want a full uh, analysis, if you want to limit the results to a specific gene list, you can also generate a gene list from the phenotype that you have entered in this step. And then finally, you would click Start Analysis to launch it. So this is what the results uh, look like. Here I'm showing you uh, a whole exome analysis. This is one of the genome in a bottle uh, public samples. So the first thing you see here is the results table. Each of the rows in this table represents a variant. So here we have a simple, let's say, representation of the variant, the genomic position. In this case, it's chromosome 22. And it's a SNV from a, from a G to A, but we can also have insertions or deletions, and we, in, in which case, we also give you the, the length. This is the gene that was used, the primary, let's say, gene that the uh, variant affects. There may be more, in which case we would show them here in this column of overlapping genes. So when a variant, either you have nested genes or overlapping genes in the other strand, or perhaps the, the variant falls in the flanking region of a gene. So we will include any other genes that might conceivably be affected. Then in the table, you have the option of adding uh, comments. So this is an example. It's not a not a real comment in this case, but you can comment on variants and then those comments will follow you around on all analyses where this variant is found on our system. You will see the comment you have entered in another analysis. Similarly, you can leave a comment for the gene. It's not a particularly informative comment in this in this case, but you can you can put whatever you need. So next here we have the ACMG uh, classification. So this is our implementation of the ACMG criteria. So we have taken the, the rules published by the ACMG and we have implemented an automatic classifier that will classify even completely novel unknown variants according to the ACMG criteria. So first you see the verdict and then the specific rules that were applied to reach that verdict. And if you go down here, you can see the breakdown. Excuse me. So you can see exactly how this verdict was reached, what rules were applied, and you can also see what rules were not applied. And in all cases, you get an explanation of why. So this is very important for us. We don't want to give you black boxes. We want you to know. And if you disagree, if you believe that we are wrong or you have information that is not available to us, 
you can turn rules on and off and that will update the verdict. So you can also use this as a manual, let's say classifier, allowing you to apply different rules and see how the verdict would uh, change according to the ACMG criteria. Finally, you can save this as a manual classification, in which case it will appear as a little dot here. For example, this one, although it's pathogenic, I have marked it as a DUS. And again, this will follow you around in all of your analyses and wherever you see this variant. Uh, moving on to the table, we give you the HCBS uh, notation at the transcript level, at the protein level, the coding level. We give you the position, let's say, of the variant in the transcript. So in this case, it's an inch on nine of 20. Of course, most genes in human have multiple transcripts. So what we are showing you here is the position in the transcript which was chosen for the, the, the pathogenicity classification. We choose the transcript based on various things. First of all, we will always try to show you the most pathogenic interpretation possible. So if the same variant is benign in one transcript and pathogenic in another, we will show you the pathogenic because we don't want you to miss any potential pathogenic variant. Then if all the transcripts are equal, we will default to the main uh, transcript. Uh, if main as in the MANE, the, the project between Ensemble and, and CBI. So the main should be the most clinically relevant transcript. If there is none, we go for the canonical. And if there is none, we, we will simply need to show you the long. Here, in this particular case, the user of, who launched the sample had associated these uh, phenotypes. And here we show that of the phenotypes associated with the sample, three are linked to genes affected by this particular variant. We give you the mode of inheritance then the function indicates a function of the variant in the various transcripts. So in this case, we have one that is splicing, meaning it falls near a canonical splicing. It is also intronic. So either this is in the same transcript and it's intronic, but here it's splicing, or it's referring to this function in another transcript. And it's also in a three prime flank. This is obviously in another transcript. So again, because a variant may have different functions in different transcripts, here we will show you all of them. The next column is a visual representation of the zygosity, where half a box means the variant was heterozygous and a full box means it was homozygous. The frequency of the variant in the population were available. In many cases, of course, it's not available because the variant is novel. The allelic balance, so this is the proportion of reads uh, supporting the variants versus the reference. And the coverage of that position, and we also have links here that allow you to open the variant position in either JBrowse or IGD to uh, industry standard uh, BAM file viewer, where you can actually look at the raw data that we use to call this variant and what support it has. So you can see here that the variant, in this case, is a very clear image. So moving on, we have down here a lot of extra information, which I will not uh, go through, but just so you have a general idea, one example here is the region browser that allows you to investigate the, the genomic neighborhood of the variant and see where it falls with respect to the gene that it affects. You also see here all known variants across multiple databases. So for example, ClinVar or, or Unicode variants or anything else we have added, and you can see how the variants cluster as expected on the exons. And this is particularly useful if you are looking at a gene with which you are not particularly familiar or it is not very well studied, and you can have a look at how resistant this gene is to variation because the position of the variants here indicates their pathogenicity. So variants that are red and above this center line are pathogenic, those below are benign. So you can get an immediately an, an idea of how resistant the gene is to variation when you are investigating. So moving on, I wanted to mention the frequencies tab. So here we have a breakdown of various uh, frequency, frequency information from different um, uh, ethnic groups where available, of course. And we have the, I'm sorry, I lost what I wanted to show right now. There we go, sample view. So the sample view is giving you a graphical representation of the variant seen in this specific sample. So here you can investigate the, the variants identified in the patient you were currently looking at as opposed to the variants uh, overall. And in the same way as before, you can see. So I 
need to apologize because I'm using a computer I am not familiar with. So I'm clicking on the wrong button. So what I wanted to show is that here you can zoom out and see the variants as they were clustered in the different genes of the exam. So moving on, I want to show you a uh, quality control report. So this is for the uh, result for the analysis we were looking at. This is the QC report that will give you an overview of your sequencing. So information like, for example, the percentage of reads that fall in the target regions as expected, and then a breakdown of the different coverage levels you may have across your sample, the a summary of the type of variants in terms of whether they were known or novel, the how many in different uh, variant uh, classifications, the genistic classes, the US and the nine and the genetic, et cetera. And we also have the class QC report. So this will show you the quality of the sequencing and let you see if there is any problem that needs to be investigated. Now we support uh, family trio analyses and general movie sample analyses. Here I'm showing you a, a family trio. So this is the affected offspring of healthy parents. We have exactly the same information with the addition that we have three values for the zygosity. So we have the child, the mother, and the father. And here, for example, you may want to filter and find the, the novel variant. So this is something else that we, we offer uh, functionality for specific filtering types like this. And here I have run one already. So the idea is to identify variants that are present in the child and were not inherited directly from the parents and therefore could be causative of whatever disorder the child is suffering from. But the parents are not. So here you will see that in the results of the de novo filter, you see only variants that are identified in the program in the child, but not in the parents. So moving on, I would like to also show you a somatic sample. So what I was uh, showing so far was a germline one. In the case of a tumor sample, a somatic sample, we show not only the pathogenistic classification according to the ACMG criteria but also the pathogenistic classification according to the AMP hearing system, which is the primarily used for uh, cancer. So in a similar way to what I showed before for the uh, germline classification, we have the tiers and we have a specific rule that have fired, that have applied to place the variant in the tiers. And again, if you go into the, uh, the detail below, you can see for every rule that was applied exactly why was applied and again you may choose to change it and change the importance and that would place the variant in a different key. Moving on I also want to show you an example of a CNV uh, analysis. In this case this was a CNV analysis that started from a class Q uh, input file and I'm just uh, selecting one one variant. So again, we will give you the position of the variant, the length, uh, whether or not it passes some basic uh, quality control criteria. Specifically, we indicate whether or not the coverage was sufficient to be uh, for the call to be reliable at that position, whether the there were at least two running CMD uh, calling from past you. We require multiple samples to be used as control, and here we where it would indicate if the control did not have enough coverage to be used at that particular position. And finally, we also point out if the CNV overlaps so-called camouflage region of the genome. So these are regions that are particularly resistant to NGS analysis. For example, the, the classic example of this are regions of segmental duplication, which means that there are multiple regions of the genome that are identical, and therefore a small read of 200 base pairs cannot be align uniquely to one region of the genome. As a result, the read aligner doesn't really know where to align it and will give it a very low score. And this confounds uh, variant analysis there. So we have the copy number and whether it's a deletion or a duplication, affected genes, a quality score. And here also we have the uh, pathogenistic classification according to the ACMG guidelines. Similarly, we have the rule and the breakdown if you come to investigate. And we also have the CNV browser, which is a graphical representation of the CNV. So what you see here, what you see here, is the gene with the exonic structure. In this case, we have a deletion, and I know it's a deletion because it's an empty box. A duplication would be a full box. 
and it's affecting these two exons of the gene. And you can see each line here represents one of the regions targeted by the assay that was used. And in this case, that's some, a whole exome analysis. You can see that it clearly corresponds to the position of the exons as expected. And in this track over here, you can see the coverage across both the test sample in red and the control samples in blue. And what you can see here quite clearly is that you have a dip in the coverage at precisely the location of the CMV, which is what you would expect in the case of the deletion. So in this way, you can visually look at your CNV results and make up your own mind on whether or not this is worth investigating, worth reporting. Now, this is the main type of data that we can provide, but obviously one of the first things that you will always need to do when dealing with this sort of analysis is filter the results to get to something actually manageable. So, for example, here in this uh, whole exome analysis, we have 104,000 variants. This is obviously not something that can be easily treated. So, what we do to help you is, first of all, we list these in order of pathogenicity. So, as you go down the variant table, you'll see that the, the predicted pathogenicity uh, goes down. And as I move forward, you, you would move on to the BUSs and likely the nine. But you need to be able to do more filters. So, let's just have a look. Here, you can go and create a filter, and you can filter in very many different uh, criteria. For example, you can set specific uh, ACMG criteria that should or should not have fired. Similarly, for AMP, you can limit by the frequency and population. You can look at the ClinVar uh, annotation. You can also use our own pathogenicity predictions. You can filter by chromosome and position, by specific genes, by coverage, by zygosity. There are many, many options that you can add here. And in the interest of time, I have created one already. So what I have here is a very straightforward and simple filter. I want things that are very, well, not very, that are not very frequent in the population. So this frequency threshold, as you can see, is really quite permissive. It's not very, uh, very strict at all. Then I want things that are either pathogenic or likely pathogenic or BUS. I don't want things that are benign or likely benign. And I want things that are likely to affect these, the, pro, the sequence of the protein. So this means either coding, either the fall in a coding action, or splicing, so they could disrupt splicing. So these are the, the two main categories of things that are likely to affect the sequence of the protein. And what you see here, I've created the filter, and I haven't applied it yet, but already you can see how many variants would be removed by each step of the filter, allowing you to fine-tune them, and you can turn specific filters on and off within this filter set. So then I can apply it, and this will just take a few seconds to reload. And now you can see that even with this very, very naive, straightforward filter, I've gone from 104,000 variants to just 255, which is already much, much more manageable. And you can stack filters on top of each other. So you can add more and create your own filters and choose what you want to see. Now, on top of that, we have what we call algorithmic filters, and I showed you one before, the Novo the variants, and these are more sophisticated filters. These run as little programs, little, uh, little Python scripts that are running in the background on our server that allow us to do much more sophisticated and advanced, let's say, filtering. So I mentioned the, the Novo variants. Another uh, important one is, for example, this uh, TRIO recessive, which was uh, developed for cases. Again, this is uh, aimed at family trios, but we are looking for both things that are not necessarily uh, inheriting directly from the parents, but we are also looking for cases, say, compound heterozygosity. So this will search for variants that are found where the, the, the proband has two variants in the same gene, and therefore the combination of those variants may be what is causing the, uh, the phenotype, the observed phenotype. And we also have this relatively new feature, uh, we call it Varsum Picks. So this is, a, this is essentially a machine learning approach that links the variants found to the phenotypes provided and focuses on the most likely candidates for the, the phenotypes 
provided. So if you were to apply this as I have in this particular example here, I was looking at, you can see that the top picks, uh, the version picks, excuse me, analysis focuses and returns here only 35 variants, so directly filtering everything out and gives you what our system believes are the most likely variants of interest given the phenotypes that you have uh, given for the sample and any other information we may have available. So the last thing I wanted to mention a bit more here is for the somatic sample, which I showed you briefly before. I also want to show off this uh, particular information. So we have this very useful cancer summary tab that is giving you information of, about this variant and what is known in other public databases about this variant. So here we see how many samples with this variant have been uh, reported in, in, in clinical databases like the ICGC somatic or pulse rate or cancer hotspot, breakdown by sex and the vital status of what this can give you an indication of the prognostic power, let's say, of this particular variant. And we also show you how well this variant correlates with what is known. So in this particular case, we have a variant that is cancer match. This means that the variant, the, the sample you're looking at, let's say it is a breast cancer sample, and there's at least one other breast cancer sample with this variant. And at least one other sample where this variant was found in the same tissue as the sample under investigation, in the same age group, and in the same ethnicity. So again, this helps you get an overview of the, of the variant and the importance of it. So to wrap up, what I have very, very quickly shown you here is a snapshot of the analytical performance of the Varsity Clinical Platform, the way you can filter your variants and focus in quickly, and in some cases even automatically, on the variants of interest. And the objective here always is to make your work easier and faster. So with these very powerful filtering tools, you should be able to identify the variant and then investigate to your heart's content. Now, one very last thing I want to show because I forgot to before and mentioned, this is a clinical tool. As a clinical tool, it is important that the data do not change. So if you run an analysis this year and then look at it again in five years, you will see the exact same information you had five years ago. So you can know why you made the decision you made back when you made it. However, as we all know, this is a very fast moving field. So you also want to be able to see more up-to-date information when you choose to. So what you can do here is select this current annotation button. And when you select it, this will immediately query our database and re-annotate on the fly this variant using whatever information is available to us today. And this way you can see, and you have all the same tabs, but updated information. And you can check if there's anything new. So when you have cases that have not been solved, you can come back and investigate and have a look at these variants and see if there's anything new that has come up. And if you choose to do so, you can go and re-annotate the analysis, and that will just rerun it and update with all the up-to-date information that we have today. And with that, I think I will end my presentation and give control back. Thank you for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Charles, for the uh, demo presentation on VASM Clinical's analysis tool uh, that can really support scientists uh, in accurate variant discovery, annotation, and interpretation of NGS data, which is, I would say, sometimes it's the, the stumbling factor for people in adopting NGS. So, very cool. Um, I'd now, now like to introduce Marcela Galvez, who is currently the Medical and Scientific Director of Gensal who graduated from the University of Rosario in Colombia and is the president of the Colombian Society of Human Genetics, who will speak about uh, Gensal's approach and experience using MGI's DMB seq T7, NGS data and analysis and interpretation of Barstone Clinical to help discover uh, disease causing variants to help the diagnose uh, patients effectively. So um, yes, uh, welcome uh, Marcela, lovely to have you on. 
Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, as you said, I'm going to share a little bit about our experience um, about clinical exons using MGI's uh, technology and instruments and using bars in clinical for analysis. So as Manuel and Charles previously commented a lot, my talk is going to be much easier. So first of all, I would like to, to tell you a little bit about what Gensel is. So we are a health organization focused on precision medicine and genomics and genetics. Um, and we have a sequencing center in Latin region, specifically in Bogota, Colombia, where we process a, a lot of NGS samples. So we have a high throughput NGS lab with more than 10 years of experience uh, in NGS. And for that, we have made several alliances with uh, uh, well-known companies around the world, which include, of course, MGI and Barson. Uh, with MGI, we have been working for more than five years, probably, and with Barson for, for about two years or, or, or so. And uh, we also have a demo lab for our customers that want to try our technology and our workflow, and this helps a lot uh, to understand better the technology, so you are very welcome whenever you are here. So in our sequencing center, we use uh, automation uh, robots from MGI to do uh, all our processes automated. So we do DNA extraction, RNA extraction in these uh, robots. And we also do library preparation, preparation and circularization, which is the final step in MGA sequencing in this uh, type of robots. And this allow us to have this high throughput sequencing in this each one of these uh, instruments allow us to run 96 samples um, in, in a single run. So this gives us a lot of capacity. We have currently installed uh, three, uh, sorry, four robots of these ones. So we have uh, a lot of um, samples coming up, uh, which is very nice workflow. And regarding sequencing, we have several instruments. So we have, as Manuel mentioned, uh, one of the smallest one, the G50, which we have been uh, working with since probably 2019. Um, and we have several G400s and one T7, uh, where we run mainly exomes and genomes. So the G50, we use it mainly for uh, panels, small panels, and the G400 and the T7 for a whole exome sequencing. And uh, in the G400, uh, every runs allow us to have 48 um, whole exome sequences a, a depth coverage of uh, 100x. And in the T7, each uh, flow cell allows us to run about 76 whole exome samples, and it has four uh, flow cells that we can run at the same time, but we mainly use it for whole genome sequencing. And when we put uh, the sequencing to a full run, we are allowed to do a little bit more than 60 whole genomes per run at 30x. <clears throat> so going more in depth in our experience in the clinical setting using whole exome sequencing, well, I have to say that uh, this uh, kind of approach in the clinical setting is very useful for complicated, heterogeneous and rare genetic disease. And since I am a medical geneticist, I can say uh, by heart that uh, this has been um, real, um, a really good strategy for these patients that have uh, a lot of uh, clinical features that um, are suspicion of a, a rare genetic disease, but uh, probably from a clinical point of view, it's difficult to establish which specific disease the patient has. So this is commonly known uh, as a hypothesis free test because you don't have to uh, really know specifically what you're looking for, but you are looking or, or uh, trying to find a causative uh, variant in the exome that allows us to uh, give a final diagnosis, diagnosis to the patient and of course uh, their families. So this is very important uh, because this is an, a hypothesis free test as probably Charles was mentioning before. Um, a correlation between uh, clinical and family history is very important because we can filter all the 
uh, possible causative variants in genes according to the phenotype of the patient and if it has a family history of course we can also use that information if we have an hypothesis whether this is an autosomal recessive disease or if it is uh, autosomal dominant disease recessive uh, autosomal dominant disease so this is very important uh, for the final analysis of the case and it's usually considered a cost-effective method because you can analyze of course the whole exome all the coding regions of the genes um, of the human genes in just a single run and then focus on those uh, genes that could explain the patient's phenotype so we uh, have been sequencing exomes since 2019 as i said before so we have a growing experience in this field uh, we have success, successfully sequenced more than 10,000 um, whole exome cases per year during the last years. And for that, we use the library preparation from MGI, the exome B5, which for us is very um, nice because it not only includes the nuclear genes, but also the mitochondrial genes. And that's, um, that's a plus when you have a patient that has a suspicion, suspicion of a mitochondrial disease, because what are the causative uh, variant it's an, in a nuclear gene or a mitochondrial gene, you are able to find those, um, those variants. And as I said before, for sequencing, we use uh, for whole exome sequencing, either the DMV-SEC G400 or the DMV-SEC T7. And we have had a success rate of over 90, 99%. And usually the failed cases are associated to sample conditions when we have we don't have a, a good quality or quantity of DNA to run uh, successfully the samples. And uh, with this um, um, workflow, both in library and sequencing, we have seen that we usually get a very good quality, both in coverage, in general coverage. So we have more than 97, 98% of uh, reads on, the, on target reads, and then a depth coverage of 100x in average for clinical exomes. And uh, for bioinformatics in clinical analysis, we are using, as I said before, VARS and clinical, which has been very useful to really go through the analysis and um, proposing a causative variance in the positive cases. So our workflow basically goes from once we have the sequencing and we obtain the PASQ files, we do the alignment using VARS and clinical. We have uh, a reference genome, genome to, to, to generate the BAM files, and then we do the variant calling to generate the BCA files. Then we do the annotation and finally the filtering, considering several steps, including, for example, Protect impact scientific evidence of the variants on the gene, uh, or uh, also, for example, whether the gene is related to a disease or not in I mean, database and so on. So I'm going to, I want to present some cases that we have had, have had during these years. And I could really present a lot of cases, but I have chosen some, just three cases that are um, important somehow. So this first one is a, two-year-old women that presented microcephaly, neurodevelopmental delay. Uh, she had also long language in involvement, and she presented with an abnormal and repetitive movement, and the brain, brain MRI showed uh, megacesternum magna and a thin corpus callos. Then this patient came to our institution for whole exome sequencing, and this is a, just a screenshot shot of the first um, Barson clinical analysis of the exome. And as you can see here, without any filtering, you can find a lot of variants. You can see here more than a thousand variants that you can find. And you have here everything, pathogenic, by BUS, and likely benign and benign uh, variants. And then after some filtering uh, regarding, again, phenotype, minor early frequency, uh, whether the gene is associated to the disease or to a disease or not, and so on, you can, of course, go down with this number. And for example, you can see here that in the first screenshot, we found this variant in the DDX3X gene, which was actually the causative variant, probably. And when we see this variant, um, 
Marsden Clinical allow us to classify or pre-classify pre the variant according to the ACMG criteria uh, using all the, um, you know, the, the criteria of the uh, American College of Medical Geneticists and uh, it gave us a, a really closer look to, 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 to the variant as Charles was explaining before. And uh, since this was a trio whole exome sequencing case, we could see that the index patient, the, the girl had the variant. Uh, it was a, 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 a terzygous variant, as you can see here. And then it was not inherited from the mother or from the father. They were not uh, carriers of this variant. So probably it was a, a highly probably it was a de novo variant that actually, um, was consistent with a uh, negative family history and uh, autosomal dominant uh, inheritance for this disease. So this is the report and uh, it is in Spanish, so I'm sorry about that, but basically what it says is that we have identified <clears throat> this variant in this gene and this is a nonsense variant that it's uh, classified as pathogenic variants and it's related to this disease, which is um, highly consistent with the patient's phenotype because our women are mainly affected. Uh, they are affected because uh, they have a neurodevelopmental delay, language delay, microcephaly, hypotonia, also movement disorders, and it's also related to autism spectrum disorder and abnormal brain images, including abnormal corpus callosum. So a lot of the phenotype that the, fa the patient was reported to have was related to this gene. Then we have this second case. This was again a female patient, 16 years old. Uh, she had a clinical suspicion of 3M syndrome. She presented with neurodevelopmental delay, repetitive movements, mid phase, hypoplasia, hypoplasitic, hyperterrorism, blepharophimosis, and patella luxation. And then we, when we had a look at the Barson clinical uh, information, a, a very nice thing is that we can easily analyze CMV and we found this very large CMV across chromosome 9 where you can see here that uh, these red dots are representing the deletion uh, this gray area is where the proofs are supposed to be and we see that all proofs here in this region are below or most of them are below what's expected. And then we we can see here another plot that is consistently is consistent sorry with a heterozygous deletion across this region in chromosome nine. And then we when we did a correlation with this deletion, it actually uh, is related to the micro deletion syndrome nine Q thirty one to Q thirty two, where all these genes are involved. And it's actually related somehow to the patient phenotype. So this syndrome is related to neurodevelopmental delays, short stature, partial dysmorphism, skeletal anomalies, cleft and cardiac abnormalities, among others. It is very important to highlight that this syndrome has a lot of heter clinical heterogeneity. So the patient does not have all the criteria or all the features described for the syndrome, but it has she has uh, some of them, so it could definitely be the cause of the disease. And then the third case is also a female patient, three years old, who presented because she had a, a skeletal dysplasia, dysplasia su suspicion. Uh, it was suspected that she had a sp spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia because she had short stature, irregular metaphysis, short thorax, thoracic hyperlordosis and a consanguinity between the parents were was reported. So an autosomal recessive pattern was probably uh, one of the things we were going to look in the analysis uh, of this case. And uh, effectively we found a pro highly probable causative variance in, variant in clean bar. But it was not related to a skeletal dysplasia. It was related to this gene, GALNS, which is uh, a causative gene for uh, one of the mucopolysaccharidosis. And we can see here that the patient had 
uh, a homozygous variance. It, it is present in all the breeds. And we can see here, and I wanted to show also this case, that sometimes we don't get very good depth coverage and we can have this gap. So it's very important always to have a look at the entire region and to check the total count of the variant and, and, and to see and correlate whether it is a, a heterozygous or a homozygous variant. And in this case, like I said, we found a likely pathogenic homozygous variant in this gene that was related to mucopolysis caridosis type 4A, which is an autosomal recessive disorder. And uh, in the clinical follow-up of this patient, she indeed had um, enzymatic, the enzymatic defect uh, that is causative of this disease. So in general, this is what we can do in the clinical setting for whole exome sequencing. Uh, but still, we have some challenges that I cannot finish without mentioning. So for example, we still find that secondary findings are something that we should, should take care about. Uh, informed concern, consent should always be filled in before. Uh, the patient goes to a whole exome sequencing because you can find things that you are not looking for. For example, in these uh, patients with rare diseases, you can also find, um, for example, that they are carriers of a disease, that it's an important feature for their reproductive risk. But also you can find, for example, diseases such as hereditary cancer that during the childhood are not very important, but it will take relevance in the adulthood. So it's very important to, 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 to confirm whether the parents or the patients really want to know um, these secondary findings or not. And uh, the American College of Medical Genetics have a 78 gene list where these secondary findings should be reported. And uh, whether this is just a guideline um, anyway, you have to, to check with the patient whether they want to know or not. CMB calling and analysis is, in, is still challenging for NDS. So, for example, like the case I, saw, I show you, when you have a very large CMB, it's quite easy to see and confirm that it's a real uh, CMB. But when you have a small, for example, monoexonic CMBs, there's always a challenge in because it can be artifacts of the variants or the bioinformatic pipeline. And you have to be very, very careful when reporting these CMVs. And finally, also, uh, variants of unknown significance are still a challenge. I think the discussion in the clinical setting is still whether we should be reporting or not uh, all these variants of unknown significance that we can find that probably most of them are not going to be um, really clinical significant, but some of them could be, so that's something important. And reclassification of the variants, so periodically you should be reclassifying variants, but when you have this amount of cases, and you have a whole exome sequencing, so you are not focusing on just 15 or 100 genes, but the whole exome, uh, it's still a challenge to have a uh, way to reclassify um, uh, periodically these variants. Finally, I want to show you um, a small study that we presented last year at the American Society of Human Genetic Conference. Uh, it was uh, a study that uh, pretended to um, uh, inform about the diagnostic yield in our whole exome sequence. It included only 100 patients, but it was kind of relevant for us. And uh, as I said, we use the same workflow and then we compare single tone analysis versus trio analysis. And what we found is that um, in general, the diagnostic yield for single tone whole exome sequencing is around 29% and for trio exome is around 32%. So it really led us to, to confirm that our diagnostic yield is very similar to previously to what is previously reported in other uh, populations, but also that our workflow with this uh, MGI plus Barsom um, workflow is uh, according to what is expected and it's published before. 
So in conclusion, I want to say that I consider that whole exome sequencing is a cost-effective diagnostic strategy uh, with a diagnostic yield between 20 to 32 percent in our cohort. And uh, MGI's dmv seq technology has enabled to have graded cost-effective and uh, certainty in the results. And Barson Clinical, we think it's a useful resource for clinical analysis of whole exome sequencing cases and variant interpretation. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much uh, for that enlightening presentation, Marcella, in, uh, in sharing your experience with DMB Seq and, and Barsome's uh, analysis tools, and also just on GenCell's infrastructure on utilizing MGI technology within the lab, and obviously applications and experience and challenges that you have for whole exome. So thank you all very much uh, to our three speakers today. Um, we do have some questions. So I would like to just uh, open the floor for them. And one of the questions, so this will be for Charles, um, is, is the analysis solution for um, Varso and CEIVD? Perhaps you can just... Um, yeah. uh, yes. yes, it is uh, currently CEIVD, and we're in the final stages of getting full uh, IVDR certification. As far as I know, we will be the only such uh, tool on the market. Uh, if I'm mistaken, my apologies, but I certainly haven't heard of anyone else who is there. And we are, we, we hope to have full ABDR certification by the end of this year or the, the beginning of that. Cool, great. Uh, this one is for, uh, this one is for, um, this one's for Manuel, is we have a T7 uh, sequencer. Is it necessary to buy a Zetron Lite for it? Or can I get by with just the Zetron Pro to make FOSQ file generation faster? Uh, yes, here depends on the on the results you want to have. For example, if you just need to um, have FSQ files as output, then Zetron Lite would be enough. But of course, if you want to integrate right FSQ and secondary analysis to accelerate turnaround time, then also uh, Zetron Pro would be necessary. Great. Um, one for I think this one is also applied to practical experience. So for Charles and, and Marcella, uh, does Varsom trust BCF file generated uh, by other third party programs for variant calling? And uh, does Varsom provide warnings if a variant does not meet QC metrics? Right. I think uh, I can feel both of those. Uh, yes, in terms of uh, trust. If you give us a VCF file, we interpret that as a request to annotate every variant in that VCF file. So, however, if once the variants in the VCF file have been analyzed, you can further filter and you can filter by the information in the VCF file, so you can remove uh, after the point. But if you give us a VCF, we will annotate all of those variants in that VCF. So in that, in that sense, yes, we do trust it. We will annotate the information you give us. Uh, as for the warnings, so there are two levels to this. First of all, yes, when there are each issues detected in the sequencing, so if there's something is wrong in the past QC report, or for example, we have a, a, an area of uh, unexpectedly low coverage and various other possible problems, and this is something that we're actively developing, so next time you ask, you'll have more things to add there. But if such issues are detected in the sample, then that will, uh, a warning will appear on the analysis. You get a red uh, triangle for errors and a yellow for warnings and things like that. And then if a variant has not passed the QC criteria, what happens there depends on how the analysis was run. At launch, the user may choose to see all variants or to limit the results to only the variants that pass QC criteria. So if you choose to, to see only those that pass, then that's all you will see, and that's the end of the of the story, if you choose to see all of them, then any variant that did not pass the QC criteria will be shown ungenotype, meaning instead of having a half full or a full blue box, as I showed before, to the genotype, we will have a gray box and that indicates that it was not genotype. So you can immediately see them and pick these uh, variants out. Plus, you can filter and say, show me only variants that pass QC. So even if you have them there, you can apply a temporary filter to remove them. And focus on those that pass if you see great uh this one's a, another one for for charles does Varsom take a vcf generated by open source cnv callers and do annotation and classification yes 
So, so we do have a requirement. The requirement is that the VCF has to be standards compliant, has to be a valid VCF file. Uh, VCF is a very, very complicated uh, format, and in many cases, we get uh, tools that don't produce valid VCFs. But as, as, as long as it is a valid VCF that follows the, the VCF standard, we, we can we can it. And Charles, this one's also for you. If you uh, so. The Vasem Clinical is very interesting. Where can we get more information uh, or talk with the people from your team? Well, the easiest way to do that would be to just visit varsum.com and you should have all the information there. You will see uh, various other options or you can email us at uh, support at varsum.com, which is the technical support email, which is the one I remember off the top of my head. And we will then forward it to the business guys who can get in touch with you. Right. Uh, I think that's all questions for today. Um, for the registration for the other webinars, uh, you can go onto the Genomics Unlock uh, webinar landing page uh, to see what are the up and coming webinars that we have in the series. Uh, we will also keep updating these as we uh, finalize some of the speakers uh, for what's to come. So thank you for your time and for joining today. Um, and then, as you can see, just maybe we can see each other again on the 13th of June uh, and the 20th of June. So I hope to see you at our upcoming webinar. And yeah, uh, thank you again to uh, Marcella, Charles and Manuel for the presentations today. And yeah, keep well and goodbye for now.